Good morning. Good morning. It is uh, wonderful to uh, be in our in your midst. Um, I am a friend of uh, Pastor Alex, and so um, he sends his greetings. And um, and it is uh, yeah, it is. So I know that you are people that are well trained in the Word, and um, and are you know and have uh, heard the Word and um, heard most certainly heard the gospel. Um, this morning, um, I have entitled my message, Just Stop. God is in control. And I want to begin this morning by asking you two questions um, that are usually pretty quick for us to answer, but the heart behind it is not, it, it's not so much whether we give the correct answer, as much as it is the heart and what we sang about this morning, the trust that is behind it. The first question I have for you is, who or what do you turn to first when you are in trouble? Now, I don't just mean first in terms of priority. You know, for, for you uh, married people, you know, the first person you might tell is your spouse. And I'm not trying to chide you to say, oh, how could you go to your spouse before you go to God? But I mean, in your heart of hearts, in terms of who it is that you know can rescue you and come through, who is first? Secondly, do we believe that God is in control? It seems like a very simple yes, no question. But when we start, and even when we reflect sometimes, we go back and we look at a situation and then look at how we handle it, you know, it's really easy for us to ask you that question. But when we come down to it, because there are times, and we know this, right? We know this, that there are times that we trust God, and then we look back and we're like, oh man, could I have gotten a better result if I went about it some other way? And this is kind of a little bit of what our scripture reading was this morning. You know, we, 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 you know, and, and I'll go into it and why it pertains to Psalm 46. You know, but we have these, this general Sennacherib from the Assyrian, this king, and, and he's basically kind of mocking um, God's people. And he's saying, well, look how powerful we are. And every single other nation that we've come against are, you know, we have defeated them. And back then, it wasn't just nations going to war. But when nations went to war, it was symbolic that their gods were going to war. And so the God that delivered them, and so he's basically saying, hey, who are you guys that you think your God can defeat our God? Like our God's defeated every other God. And yet God's people were the only people worshiping the one true God. And so we kind of, we kind of see these, even how, how back then these two questions mattered. And I think today these questions still matter. All right, so this is a Psalm 46. Um, and let me, uh, oops, let me catch up for my, um, Yes. And so Psalm 46, I want to make sure that on the same slide, um, is uh, written by the sons of Korah. And, um, and the sons of Korah, many believe, were commissioned by King Hezekiah. And so this is a, Psalm 46 is first a royal psalm. And it, a royal song basically describes how God works through the office of king. That's what makes it royal. And most people uh, attribute Psalm 46 to possibly three authors. Okay? And so I'm just telling you this because my conclusion is that I think that Hezekiah is the author of this. You may hear other people tell you that it's Joseph Ed. You may hear other people tell you that it's King David. Okay? And so I've given you those scripture references. I think the point more importantly, is the God that is behind each of those kings. Okay? Um, let's go to the next slide. So once again, to give you a summary of Second Chronicles, that um, passage that we read this morning, um, the enemies of God were the Assyrians, led by King Sennacherib. And um, the Assyrians were a very cruel people. They were known for leaving poles, once they conquered a nation, they would leave poles and they would have the heads of the people 
that they conquered. And this was like an intimidation tactic to tell anyone who wanted to mess with the Assyrians, like, hey, this is, we don't just defeat you. We defeat you, we humiliate you, and then we want you to know how powerful we are. And so this, is, this was one of many cruel practices that they did. Um, and then King Hezekiah, what King Hezekiah is most known for is that often when a nation would try to conquer another nation, so Jerusalem is one of the few cities back then that was not um, around a, a, it wasn't built, the major cities that wasn't built around a body of water, right? And so a lot of times when nations wanted to defeat another nation, what they would do is they would just outnumber them outside the wall, and then they would just wait for their resources to run out, and at some point they would have to go outside of the wall, which is the case. So God's people are outnumbered. They are inside this enclosed area, inside a wall. And so what, what uh, Hezekiah is known for is he made these underground tunnels. And, um, and so what, when the, um, and then it, then it was attached to this like river. So somehow the water filtered through the river. And, um, and, so, and so they had water coming in. And so what they did um, in our surgery is they went out and they shut off all the water outside. So they used the very same strategy that most had many of these come. And they used the strategy. And, and so they thought, okay, and, you know, that's why in the scripture reading this morning, it's like, oh, why should, you know, why should the enemies of God uh, have access to water and things like that? So that's what he's most known for. And so here in, in 2 Chronicles 32, especially in verses 10 to 20, uh, Sennacherib goes straight at the fears of the people. He basically says, oh, is your God going to be able to deliver you? Um, is he going to be able to do this? And in fact, he goes as far as to write letters to the people. He, he's outside and he's mocking them. And so it, it, it brings those two questions to mind. Who do we turn to when we're in trouble? And do we really believe that he's in control? That that he's a God that is faithful and good. Things that are easy to roll off our tongues, but when the rubber meets the road, is that what we believe? And Psalm 46 um, tells us that it, it gives us three reasons to do that. It gives us three reasons to do that. You know, we live in a stress-filled world full of troubles for students you know, you worry about homework and exams and unfair teachers sometimes. For working people, you, work, you worry about work, you worry about job stability, and you worry about unfair bosses sometimes. For parents, you worry about your children and their safety. Do you know that one of the most popular products and sales have increased by 300 percent um, for bulletproof backpacks. And these things cost anywhere from a hundred to five hundred dollars and basically all it is is that there, there are these little metal plates that you put inside backpacks and they're kind of meant to basically kind of, you know, in the case of a situation, it's kind of meant to just be kind of a shield that people can hide. Um, that, that children can hide behind. Literally, these backpacks for kids is a place of safety to hide. And so, in a world full of fears, how are we to respond as people of faith? And Psalm 46 reminds us that God is in control and that He is on our side. And it gives us Three reasons to trust God as we navigate through this space of time in our culture. First, uh, I want to I want to tell you that um, and you have that's good the outlines out there, so you'll see the three points. Um, you are the first. This generation is the first post-Christian generation. In a sense, if for for those of us, and I, I can tell most of us in here are um, are 
past the age of 25. Okay? Most of us have grown up in where things were safe for us, right? Like, you know, back then, you trusted schools, you trusted banks, right? You know, not, not so much you trusted the government. These were things that you saw as stable things, right? And, you know, not so much now. Um, in a 2018 poll by Barna, it found that 50% of youth did not think that gender was signed at birth. And a third said it was what a person felt. And another 12% said they did not know. These are things that if we were to take, you know, a poll in the church, we would think that it would be, you know, that it would be a number close to 100% of people just assume that, that. And I'm not trying to touch too much of this topic as much as it is. I'm trying to point out this is the culture that we live in presently. And we are, and yet we believe, right, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That he's not any less able to act. And so when we look back at Psalm 46, we say, wow, this is how God responded to this situation. And so whatever situation it is that we find ourselves in the present, we can turn to the same God. So let's start. Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3. First of all, we're going to look at God's presence and protection. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Selah. Selah is a term that you will see in the Psalms that just means pause and give thought to what you just heard. So those first three verses that you just heard, now the psalmist says, pause, think about it. It just happens that today's passage has three selahs, and that's where I broke the passage. So I'm not just uh, trying to give you a three-point sermon in the box. That's what the passage says. So had there been five selahs, you might have a five-point sermon. Had there been two today, you have a two-point sermon. Okay, but the first thing, you know, the, that's the first thing. Charles Spurgeon said, the greatness of thought in this psalm was and is worthy of pause and careful thoughts. The verse describes God as a refuge. A refuge is defined as a place of safety, a shelter from danger. John 10, 7, and verse 9 says this. Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The psalm is, Psalm 46 is also a psalm of confidence. The psalm where the psalmist expresses confidence even in the midst of chaos and confusion. The most famous confidence psalm is Psalm 23, um, which you know, many of us know. Um, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. And so what God promises in the midst of 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 um, just chaos and confusion as he promises his presence. That is the great promise of God. God doesn't promise to always deliver us. And so, you know, there's times when, when people, um, you know, and I even think back at, you know, in different times of history where really influential people were this close to giving their lives entirely to God and maybe to Turn um, because the situation didn't turn out the way that they thought. 
you know, and and yet we also have seen the opposite of some very strong leaders. So God promises his presence. You know, at Christmas we, we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. And in this passage, it says he is our refuge, our strength, and not just help. The passage says a very present help. How present? So present that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us. And so literally every place that we go, regardless of what our situation, what our condition is, God is with us. You know, I have many years of schooling. You know what probably the most important thing that I learned in seminary was? And it wasn't even from one of my professors. I remember we were in this class and this guy said, you know, everywhere that we go, we carry the presence of Christ into that situation. I was like, whoa, this came from one of my classmates. And I was like, you are right. You know, we may have, you know, theologically, you know, he was going into, he was talking about Moses and how, you know, we could take possession of every place. I don't know that we're completely on the same page as that. But his point was really well taken. Really impressive. Wow, you have this amazing faith. Because man, how different life might be if we remember that more often. Every place that we go, we carry the presence of Christ. So it doesn't matter if we have a very unpopular opinion. We carry Christ's presence. So the passage in Psalm 23 told us that we're comforted by God's rod and staff. And, and I know someone's going to ask, rod and staff is sometimes used synonymously in Scripture. In Psalm 23, rod, the rod was used to defend the sheep, using it as a weapon when enemies attack. And it was a symbol of love. In Leviticus 27.32, though, a rod was used to count the tithe. And so the shepherd would use the rod to count the the staff was often used by the shepherd as an item of rest, and so while he was keeping watch, he would lean on this staff. It was almost like he would like sleep standing up. Um, and, and, you know, and it's in the same way that we could lean on the Lord. The, the end of the staff, the, the crook, so it's kind of like a little, almost if you imagine like a cane, right? Um, you know, it was often used to pull a sheep back from danger or to lift him up before he, he fell into a ditch. And the shepherd staff um, from the book, A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, gave it one other purpose. Sometimes the sheep would, sheep would be attacked in the middle of the night. So if you imagine um, these days, it's an uh, unusually cold winter, has not it, guys? <laughs> right? Um, at least by California standards. And, um, you know, it would be foggy, right? Imagine it's going to be this dark, it's foggy, um, and a, an enemy attacks. And so the sheep are, the sheep, they're, they're confused. They don't know what's going on. And so what the shepherd would do is he would take the staff and he would tap on the ground. And so even though they were surrounded by danger, they were confused. Right? Oh, oh, no, what do I do? That tapping let them know that their heavenly Father was in you. And we, we spoke earlier, right? That um, God is with us. And, and you know, and, and sometimes we forget that. And, and sometimes all we need to know, though, is that He is near. And uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm a single guy, so this is. Um, you know, uh, this is uh, this is my daughter. <laughs> That's my four-legged daughter. Uh, you know, a lot of pressure being a pastor's daughter. So there she is, praying. I'm not sure she's really praying, actually. Uh, next slide. And uh, yeah, there's another picture of her. This is Audrey Huffman. She passed in 2018, but you know, most pastors uh, they they show pictures of their family. So uh, this is this is my forever this is my forever daughter. You know, um, when I adopted her. Um, 
you know, she basically, and those of you who are dog owners in here, you know, like, your dog is just like your, your shadow sometimes. Any, any of you guys have a dog that just follows you around everywhere? And, and you know, this, this dog in particular um, just had to have body contact with you. Like, I noticed that um, whenever it was that, like, say I was watching TV or on the computer, she would come and she would sit right by my feet. And if her paw, or just a part of her was like nestled against me, she would, within a couple of minutes, be snoring. She just, you know, like, didn't even know where, where she was. And then there were times when, you know, after she fell asleep, and I would, you know, go, go walk somewhere in the house to do something. And then when she woke up, she was like, oh no, oh no, where, where are you? You know, right? And so there's something for her. I was her father, I guess you could say. And, and there was something about just being near and present. And, and, and for these sheep in Psalm 23, even though there was darkness around them, they were scared, they were confused, there was something just knowing that their father was near. That even though they were being attacked by enemies, just the fact that they could hear the rod and staff, they could hear, they, they knew. And so, and so once again, the first thing is that God's presence and, and protection, right? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. God presents a very simple argument. He says to the psalmist, I am a safe place. I am strong and I am present. So do not fear. And then the verse goes, though the earth be removed, literally the rod, the rug gets pulled out from under us. You know, our plans do a complete 180 on us. You know, one of the things I love about Psalms is it, just poetic Im imagery. You know, in the Psalms, you know, here it, it, it tells us, uh, though it, you know, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried away in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. You know, we here in California, um, we know about earthquakes. Right? You know, and if some of you are like me and you're, you know, I'm from Taiwan originally, you know, um, I actually am more scared of Taiwan earthquakes than California earthquakes. Um, you know, mainly because the buildings are, you know, the likes of buildings are a little higher and things. Um, but, the, you know, I remember being in the midst of the uh, Northridge earthquake in the, in the 90s. You know, I was actually, maybe, 90s, around that time, in the early 90s. And I was a student um, at UCLA, and um, I remember that, I mean, it was a shaky, it, it shook so hard that we had one of those Arrowhead water coolers, and it got knocked down. And, you know, my kitchen was a mess, and we didn't have for two days, and my roommate and I really bonded <laughs> over those two nights without electricity. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, this, you know, here, it, it gives us, a, you know, in a sense, a picture, right? Like, I don't know how violent of an earthquake you've ever been with, but I've never had an earthquake so crazy that, that the thought was that the earth would be removed and the, the, the mountains would be shaking and swelling. And yet, here, here that's, that's, the, the, that's, that's the word picture that the Psalms paints with us. That even if our world literally falls apart like that, to the point where not only do the mountains fall apart, but they get carried into the sea. Everything that has been said in these first three verses remains true. He's present, he's strong. He's a God that protects us. Verses four to seven. God's power. God's power. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacle most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her just at the break of dawn. The nations rage. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. 
This, this is also a Zion psalm, verse 4. The city of God, of course, it is Jerusalem. And Zion was a place where the temple was located. And it's really ironic, actually, because um, you know, in some of the other verses, and I, I didn't put them in anything, but the wall, the, the temple was, where the temple was, was ironically the place where they were weakest. That wall had been damaged, and so they were constantly rebuilding it. And yet, the thing that was there, if someone could get over that part of the wall, the weakest part of the wall, was a place that represented where the presence of God was. And so ironically, the place that seemed weakest was the place that was, that was strongest. And so Jerusalem, you know, once again, was, was this place where um, it was fortified on all sides except the north where the Assyrians were coming from. In fact, many, uh, many commentators believe that when it talks about the earth shaking, that they were actually describing the marching of the Assyrian army um, coming down. We are reminded of God's power in this, in this part of the passage in two key phrases. Verse 6, as the nations raged and kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice and the earth melted. You know, a lot of passages in the Old Testament, when it talks about God, it goes back to God as a creator. We don't think about that so much either, right? When we think about God, the first thing we think about, of course, is we think about Jesus, we think about the cross, when we think about the gospel message, right? And, and, and most certainly, wonderful, wonderful thing. But in the Old Testament, when they thought about God, they thought about the God who, who, who spoke and, and the world came into existence. And here, in this song, here the psalmist says this, he uttered his voice and the earth melted. Who is this God that does not even lift a finger he just raises his voice, and the earth melts. That's the picture that he paints here. In verse 7, we're told that he is the Lord of hosts. He is the commander of the heavenly army. Now, in our scripture reading this morning, I intentionally cut it off at verse 20 to kind of leave us in this place of distress, um, where basically, you know, where Sennacherib has, has basically brought so much doubt on God's people and in that moment they have to decide do they trust God? Is God in control? But verse 21 says this. So the second part goes 32 21. Then we read up to verse 20. Then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor leader and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. This is also explained in 2 Kings 19 35 and it says this. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpse, all dead. In Matthew 26, 53, after Judas had betrayed Jesus, um, the guards came to detain Jesus, and Peter took out his sword, and he cut off the ear of one of the guards. And Jesus tells Peter, do you not think that I cannot pray to my Father, and he will not provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? A legion is 5,000, so we're talking about 60,000 angels. And here we see this one angel of the Lord and what he did. The verse also tells us that the God of Jacob is our refuge. And here a different word is used for refuge. It's used early, you know, this word refuge is used, uh, will be used again and has been used in this verse. And here it stands for a high tower. Remember I told you that you know, over the wall was the temple, it was kind of their weakest spot, but in many ways they regarded it as their strongest spot. 
And that idea of a high tower was this place where they were protected. That no matter how many enemies were, they, it was so high that they, they couldn't reach this high tower. And so here what's this is this picture of God, the God of refuge. The God of Jacob as our refuge, not only as a safe place, but a place so safe that whatever danger was could not pass, could not reach it. And so they would have to defend the walls. And the God of Jacob, this covenant keeping God, is true to his promises. Last, we see God's peace and providence in verses 8 to 11. Come, behold, the work of the Lord who has made the earth. The, he has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. I love God, Zilla. <laughs> Those of you uh, who know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about old school, first generation Japanese Godzilla. Okay, not, not this American Godzilla, Japanese Godzilla. If you know, you know. Okay, and, and one of the things I remember as I was watching Godzilla movies when I was younger was how, you know, they would gather these armies, right? And, and Godzilla would just, you know, whatever it is that they threw at him, and he would just break it like it was nothing. In fact, one of, I have very few regrets in life. One of them was one time I was on a mission trip and I transited through Japan, so I had like a layover. So I went to the bookstore because that's what people who love books do. And, um, and they had this like the coolest toy. It was this stomp action Godzilla, right? And so, not, the, but the coolest part about the toy was not that you could put batteries in it and this Godzilla would stomp and it would, you know, and its eyes would light up and whatever. But it came with like all these little other toys, which were like these little soldiers with like these barricades and whatever. But then back then I was like, oh, I'm not going to pay airport prices. I could find this on Amazon in a few days anyway. Big mistake. <laughs> Anything that I could find, the shipping cost was more than what I could pay at the airport. I should have just bought it. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is, I think for me, this is kind of like a picture of what happens here. When he talks about he breaks the bow, he cuts the spear in two, he burns the chariot in the fire, which back then I guess would be their greatest thing, like their tank, their missiles, and whatever. Be still, he says, right? He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. You know, sometimes we turn on the news and we're just like, you know, when we, when we get discouraged, and, and it is, it's hard to see like, some of the things that go on in our world. So remember that question I asked you earlier? Do we believe that God is in control? Do we believe that he's true to his word? That, you know, any threat of nuclear weapons, that's not how the, that's not how the world's going to end. The world's going to end when our world will personally end when we die or if Jesus comes back. That, that's just what the Bible says. You either believe that or you don't. Right? God is in control. He's come once and we're looking forward to the second return and, and we say, you know, come quickly for Jesus. He's coming back. Peace is rarely absent from conflict, but it's a calmness and Quiet confidence we miss today. God is in control and He is on our side. Verse 10 is one of the most misquoted verses. It is, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted on the earth. And it's a reminder that the last two times we have been asked to pause, Selah, we were comforted by God as our refuge. 
that he is so powerful that he... But, but verse 10 is different. Verse 10 tells us that be still. And this saying, be still, and know that I'm like, I am God, is not advice for us to need a more contemplative life. There are other places in the scripture that, that say that. Okay, so definitely, it's not that this verse is saying, don't be a reflectful, thoughtful, meditative people on the word of God. But here it's saying, be still. And it means rather, lay down your arms, surrender, and acknowledge that I am the one and true victorious God. Tozer says, as you know the glory and greatness of God, stop your mouth from arguing with him or opposing him. Simply surrender. And that's what be still and know that I am God is. Be still and know that I am God is, is telling us to pause and to think about who he is in scale relative You know, I, I um, share this um, message with you, um, not just as someone who's trying to encourage you, but as someone that, that himself has found himself in situations where if God doesn't come through, um, it doesn't happen. And, you know, as our, even our song said this morning, I said, are we trusting God? We want to trust Him more and more. Um, for me personally, um, my father passed uh, very, very recently. Um, he actually passed on Thursday. You know, and um, on Tuesday, um, and then my father, uh, a couple of things about him. Um, he's a schizophrenic, so because of that, uh, he never really had like a really close relationship. You know, I, I feel like I never really knew who he was. But he basically had, had a lot of health issues going on. You know, um, and it got to a point where he was just uh, suffering. And it was, it was pretty bad, you know. So um, for the last, I would say about six to eight weeks, what I have been praying for is um, that God would visit him in a dream, somehow supernaturally share the hospital. That was my greatest concern. My two concerns were, is he going to get right with God before he dies? And the second one was, and we just wanted to ease the suffering, you know, and wanted him just to go peacefully. Um, which he did, you know, thank, thankful for that. Um, it was quite a fighter. We, we uh, you know, he was, there was just a ventilator keeping him alive. And, uh, you know, my family and I, just, uh, we had so many things wrong that even, uh, you know, um, he was at a point where we had to decide whether he was going to continue chemo, and, um, and, and basically uh, there was a surgery that he had to have, and chances are, even if he was even able to survive that, his quality of life was just going to be so terrible. I mean, the last couple of days, like, he, he couldn't even control the bowels, he pooped on himself, and that's kind of, it was just not a good And so, you know, as much as, uh, first, uh, I know it's kind of weird, but I, you know, not all of my family is believers, so I would pray that every chance I got, I could be alone with him, and every chance I got when I was alone, I would try to at least, you know, tell him Jesus loves him, try to share you know, his gospel with him. Um, but even when he was co-parent, even with schizophrenia, I don't know how much of that was comprehensive. But my point is, sometimes we focus so much on our results. And, and I think that that process of just going to God and trusting Him, that's our faith, right? And, and the scriptures tell us that without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And since the only thing that pleases God is our faith. And so what I want to do today giving you these reminders of who God is, just to tell you this is the God I know. And I think this is the God that's in the scriptures. And I think this is the God that is your God. That you can
come to you in the midst of whatever it is that you are facing. He is a good God. He is in control. He's powerful. He's present. And He is for you. I don't think we hear that in the church. Yes, we need a high, holy sense of the reverence of God. We need to fear God. That was at my closing slide. I, I put a pastor. He's, a, he's also a professor at Calvary. Um, he says, if the fear of God, <laughs> if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, uh, how wise are we? <laughs> you know, how, right? Um, but we need to also hear that this God's powerful. He's for us. And he's a God that we just sometimes we don't know what he's going to do. We don't know. But we go to him because we trust that it's no one else no one else delivers us and loves us and is for us when like the God of the Bible is. And so practically I think what I can tell you is to pray to this God. Practically what I can tell you we're near the beginning of the year is to go to Him um, and read His Word. And um, I know I'm a little bit overtaxed, so thank you for your, for your grace. Uh, let's have the worship team come back up.